Ah, uh, Lorenzo, it's always such a delight to speak to you. And I, I get another chance yet to, uh, to, to, to dive into a wonderful topic with you. And what topic is more wonderful than conspiracies? You know, especially today, I'm sure all of the algorithms are loving the fact that we're bringing up this subject. But it's a fascinating subject because so many people have different ideas of what conspiracies are, what they mean. You know, anyone who disagrees with you is, you know, part of a conspiracy or have been, they've fallen into a propaganda machine. It's very easy to see that it's um, conspiracies are what other people fall into, whereas we ourselves could never fall into one. And we associate them with being crazy, with, um, with being nuts, with, uh, with, with being um, manipulatable. But I think there's, we, you know, there's quite a lot of work on the topic of conspiracies. Um, Cash, you know, no, different writers over the ages that have spoken about them. And I thought we could maybe just go into that topic a little bit, because I think it's a, I think it's epistemologically and philosophically just a fascinating subject um, because I think conspiracies also unveil the difference between being coherent and being right. So in philosophy, yes. we talk about the difference between having a coherent worldview and then we talk about a worldview that um, corresponds with reality. But of course, if your worldview is coherent, if there's no internal contradictions, uh, it's, if it is what I like to call an internally consistent system, well, that coherence in of itself would give you reason to think that it corresponds with reality. And yet it very well may not. And so that, div that possible division between coherent, coherence and correspondence, which I think, frankly, in many respects, uh, what I try to argue in the conflict of mind is that the dream of the enlightenment is that there was only one coherent worldview because there was only one, you know, there's one truth and there's only one co coherent worldview. And if we could find that one coherent worldview, we would find the truth. But instead, it seems after Nietzsche said, uh, you know, God is dead, uh, that unleashed, you know, it, it's almost like that, that unbound us. And rather than the death of God equaling discovering the singular coherent worldview, that would be the truth. There's been this actually unleashing of many internally consistent sy systems, many coherent worldviews, or at least the problem is one that's becoming more vivid to us, one that's more apparent to us. And it's existentially very challenging. It's very, it's existentially very challenging on people. And then it's almost like it's hyper, it's put under it's hyper part of probably drive. what drives, you know, uh, people joining um, conspiracy theories, you know, oh, yeah. I guess. It's like a sense of uh, control over the, well, because I think, you know, there's something clear, clearly about the human mind that seeks the, uh, this kind of coherent structure. Oh, Even yeah. though it's interesting, because like you could argue that you know, conspiracy theorists at some point become some sort of like projection of a paranoid id, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, being very incoherent, but like it's Korean, like in its own weird way, you know, uh, that's not fully fully assumed. I think, you know, to, just to defend the Enlightenment for a second, though, I think sure. given the science that they were discovering at the time, uh, they had a very deterministic view of the world. If you mm -hmm. The analogy for the universe, it was the clock. So it wouldn't make sense that they would think like if we understood all the determinist factors you know of our society we'd be able to fully understand the human condition the world right because for the most part like the science that was advancing at the time was pointing into that direction oh yeah but i don't think any modern scientist would say that anymore because modern science has shown us that there's a great degree of like what we would perceive as randomness involved in the mechanics of the world and so there's no single framework there's no single model that can right. kind of predict everything which is why i think actually part of what's makes conspiracy theorists, you know, talking to conspiracy theorists kind of challenging is that, um, yeah, like if you don't have um, the, the right kind of, I think, epistemic training, uh, I don't think it actually makes sense to the human mind that the world could be this random. Uh, oh, sure. You know, like I think, I think that's part of, the, part of the issue. And I think, you know, to start to define this a little bit, uh, and, and for the audience members, uh, Danny and I put, put together a document with some of the references that we're going to use tonight that way uh if anybody wants to kind of delve deeper yes. they can do it after and it also enables daniel and i to be able to have like a deeper conversation uh that you know where we can just like reference things that we both share even mm. you know, without necessarily fully introducing them um but yeah like the i think the Cass sunstein paper that we shared that's probably actually i think it, so it was a one of the best papers i've ever read for context and uh it's i, I think honestly the best cognitive science account of conspiracy theorists uh, in conspiracy in conspiratorial thinking, oh yeah. Um, the way one of the observations they make that makes conspiracy theorists different than radical um, ideologues is the fact that 
Um, conspiracy theorists, again, like the appeal of a conspiracy theory to them lies in the attribution of an otherwise inexplicable event to, int to intentional action into an unwillingness to accept the possibility the significant adverse consequences may be a product of invisible hand mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, so they basically, like it's usually a response to an otherwise unexplainable event with extreme consequences. And some people, I, I, I guess I'm gonna say some people now, but like then we can talk more broadly about how we're all sure. conspiracy theorists. But like, but some people, yeah, like basically it's a trauma response in a mm -hmm. way. I think that's what the paper really helped me understand. Um, you know, it, it's almost like there's a spectrum between, uh, you know, ma manipulated people. And so you can think of advertising that way. Like we're all very susceptible to advertising, right? right? But we're all susceptible to different kinds of advertising. Um, then th there's radicalization where your ideology uh, kind of becomes like this kind of self-perpetuating worldview that it's almost impossible for you to uh, be talked out of. And instead it makes you overconfident and more aggressive. Um, and then, yeah, you have conspiracy theorists, which is like, there's no even, it's not even about interpreting the world in, uh, within some sort of ideological framework. It's uh, fundamentally being wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But it originates from, again, I think this trauma response to uh, what we could define as a black swan in many ways, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, first off, I, I like the connection. It's a good point when you say in the time of the Enlightenment, there was reason to think the universe was determined. And therefore, if you can gather more information, then that's actually going to help you figure out the determined mechanisms and that it will necessarily lead you to this single unified worldview. And that now that you have more of a sense that there's more randomness involved, then it's possible for, dare I say, sections of that random information to be coherent and to come together and have nothing to do with other sections of the data. Or, of course, it can be separated socially in terms of yeah. society yeah because like emergent them. behavior right yes. was not a is not a thing to, like that, that's not a, a the deterministic view of science of the time that's right explain like a lot of things but like today almost all scientists agree that there's some sort of their their emergent properties right oh, uh, yeah. you know they're not explainable they're not reducible to kind of the first principles i think we can that then open up the conversation about what this mean epistemologically speaking Right. Oh, oh uh, yeah. Well, and you see, if it's a determined universe, it's almost like information functions like a machine where gears are kind of turning into other gears and you couldn't pull out a gear without br breaking the whole thing. And you would therefore know automatically that you were misusing the information. But it turns out that information is more like a river. Uh, it's all flowing. And then we can take a bucket and scoop some out. And that's a conspiracy theory. And it, it's all fits in the bucket and all works great. Uh, but it's now not part of the broader context. Uh, so you're able to kind of scoop out shape information relative to the framework you wanted to, to fix and everything keeps flowing so there's no reason to necessarily think that you've removed the information from a larger context that would make it make sense uh because it's it's in your bucket and you're carrying it just fine uh so that transforms our relationship to information and therefore this is much more tricky because we have to figure out how to, say, pull out new stories, examine them separate from the bigger context of all the world events, but then put them back into the context of all the world events so that it isn't misunderstood. But of course, how can we know all of the world events at the same time? Uh, so you find this really tricky problem that seems to require very, very hefty levels of um, epistemic training. Uh, and, and yet we haven't, we're, we're typically have been led to believe that an educated person is someone who knows the right answer, who knows the right information, who's learned the right stuff. And of course you need that, but now there's this issue where, because the problem is a conspiracy can entail truth. It actually can have right information in it. It's not inherently yeah. all false. It actually could be a hundred percent true relative to the information it includes, but the information is separated from a larger context that unveils that it's misleading. Right, you well, and, 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 and I think that's what happens most of the time with conspiracy theorists. It's like yes. they stumble upon a piece of information that actually happens to be true. It just doesn't mean what they think it means. Right. But precisely because uh, we've talked about this in the in a, in a prior episode. Oh, by the way, thank you for having me again. Of right? course, anytime. Uh, but uh, yeah, this idea of like the dopamine released when you're right and everybody else thinks you're wrong is yeah. so disproportionate to what you regularly experience that. Uh, it basically permanently impairs your brain. You become like mm. a gambler chasing uh, extreme out of the money payoffs uh, because you experienced that one time. And uh, in, in my in my work with conspiracy theorists, you know, when I, I usually try to ask them like, what kind of onboarded you 
uh, to with, hmm. with QAnon, Flat Earth, or whatever. And uh, they usually say something somewhat sensical. Like uh, I asked, for example, an anti-vaxxer uh, a few months ago, uh, what kind of got them into the anti-vax train? And they said that uh, when the World Health Organization uh, told people not to buy masks. Right. But you see, but it's the kind of thing where like, you know, um, we have kind of forgotten about it. It's, it's interesting to me how much the mainstream discourse has stopped talking about the World Health Organization, the CDC coordinating yes. to tell a noble lie. And yes. obviously, like, you know, uh, you know, you and I can have a nuanced response and say, okay, 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 like, you know, uh, this is a noble lie. They just made a mistake. It doesn't mean that the CDC and the World Health Organization are always continuously sure. collaborating to screw over people. Um, but at the same time, I, I just remember what it was like kind of beforehand. Uh, I totally, you know, I remember having a conversation with friends. I was like, no, come on. Like, you know, we're overreacting to this pandemic. The World Health Organization is saying not to right. buy masks. You know, uh, we shouldn't just like take them away from the doctors and everything. Um, it totally I was wrong about that, right? Uh, but obviously mm -hmm. the experience did not like make me question every institution in my society because I understand that noble lies are a thing. But that's the kind of nuanced reasoning that I think like, not just most people are not, I don't want to say they're not capable of, but like, I think, Cognitive biases prevent us from naturally embracing uh, this idea that, like, sometimes, like, random stuff happens. And it's oh. not, uh, you know, just because you're right about some things about the conspiracy doesn't mean the whole conspiracy is right. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned the role of trauma when it comes to forming conspiracies. One of the reasons, um, you know, what is trauma? Once you have a traumatic experience, you then want to make sure you don't have another traumatic experience. So likewise, if you get reason to think that if something has happened where the World Health Organization lied to you, you're scared of be being taken advantage of. You're scared of being forced to take something that permanently hurts your body. That's the ideas that get into your head. And so you don't you don't want to have a traumatic experience. Yeah, so like you have tolerance you, changes. Yeah. So, you know, there's conspiracies that are responses to traumatic experiences. There's conspiracies that are trying to make sure a traumatic experience doesn't occur. There's also, I think, today the trauma of realizing how much you are reliant on authorities, especially as the world becomes increasingly more complex, there's more information, um, people have impact on your life who you've never met. There's a kind of trauma in that. There's a kind of disorientation in that. It gets into that great George Orwell essay where he goes and he's talking, you mentioned a flat earther, and he's like, you know, if, so, if I was put in a, sh a position where I, I myself had to convince a flat earther that the world was not flat, George L. Orwell goes, oh my gosh, I couldn't do it because all my knowledge about the planet being um, circular you exactly. know, is based on authority. And this is so fascinating. Which is good because it exposes it, right? Like it shows yes. us how, what kind of assumptions we're actually making uh, oh, yeah. on a regular oh, yeah. basis, right? That we do trust uh, authority. Well, here's the thing, right? This is what Orwell is getting at. And I tried to talk about it in the authority circle is we literally require authority to think because it's not possible for us to be an expert in everything. And yet authority can take advantage of us and authorities have taken advantage of people. So it's kind of like the hermeneutical circle, you know, that Heidegger and them talk well, about. And, about. and let's add a third category and can, they can also make mistakes. Exactly. That's correct. So then you literally have to trust fallible institutions. And there's almost in some respects, I sometimes wonder with conspiracies if there's a comforting element, because if there's a plan, that means there's like someone in control who's competent. And it's almost like, oh, good, <laughs> you know, they're evil, but at least there is the possibility of control um, that if we were to just get the right people in there, we might be able to, uh, to make things better. But once you start talking about emergent phenomena, like emergent conspiracies or like information that just falls together in a certain way that makes it look like a plot that's not actually there, well, then stuff becomes much more difficult and more, much more complex. Um, that's why it's so strange. Karl Popper talks about how conspiracy theorists um, over, over, um, overestimate the competence of bureaucracies. Yes. Because, uh, it, 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 but he, he makes an interesting point that they also make in the conspiracy theories paper by Cass Sunstein, where they contrast, like, it is much more believable that our conspiracy is taking place in a closed society versus in an open society. Yes. We should probably talk about that, like, you know, because I think that's what Popper was sort of, I think, suggesting is that in his vision of an open society, uh, you would actually, all the mistakes of bureaucracies would be out in the open. Uh, and so you wouldn't believe in a, uh, you, your understanding of the world would include the fallibility of institutions uh, as opposed to, uh, having, again, assign, attributing intentionality to events that end up being random.
Yeah, and I think Karl Popper in the Open Society is generally correct um, on the idea that in an open society, then the mistakes of the bureaucracy would be known and that if you knew your bureaucracies could mess up, then you wouldn't be likely to go into these conspiracies thinking that they have this giant broad plan because you see that they were incompetent. Um, the problem is now we don't trust our information. So society is open, but there are deep fakes. There's fake, you know, there's manipulation yeah, yeah, of yeah. the data. Well, there's, you know, there's a, a, a individual, Zach Stein, who does extraordinary work on propaganda and information warfare, where he basically says that we, uh, we're, we're in an age of weapons of mass destruction regarding in information warfare. It's going on all the time, social media, nation states, everything, so on, to the point where, it's causing a global mass insanity, you know, by insanity, you know, you can be insane and not be in the streets picketing, but as in just you, you're so incapable now of determining reality from falsity. It's yeah, like, yeah, like completely Yard's. broken sense yeah. making. Yeah, it's completely, exactly. It's Bolgeyard, the dead of the real. But when the, you see the key for Bolgeyard, when the real is dead, then also what's gone is the ability to tell that the real died. You know, when the real dies, it also takes with it the fact that it died. That vanishes as well. Um, and you see, in today's world, what Karl Popper is talking about, I don't think you can assume so easily, even though I don't disagree that in closed societies, you're more at risk of conspiracy. Um, I mean, the other thing, too, is you can have smaller conspiracies um, that that even, like, for example, I, I, I learned this quite recently. I had no idea about this. Um, you know, in the, the school protests in the 60s, that you had mm -hmm. all these protests in the 60s. Well, apparently the freaking CIA was funding those, uh, even though they were anti-government protests because they wanted to make it America look like a pro-protest society. So it made the Soviet Union look bad. So a lot Interesting. of- Interesting. Isn't yeah, that crazy? Yeah, so so th this, this is, I think, opens up, uh, you know, the convo about the conspiracy pyramid, right? Because we can talk mm -hmm. about, like, I think most people that like uh, criticize conspiracy theorists do not actually know how many conspiracies actually turned out to be right. That's the key. Yes. Right. Exactly. And I think the CIA stuff is like a great example of like, I mean, beyond like the geopolitical stuff that they did in terms of like infiltrating sure, 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 foreign sure, governments, sure. right? You know, but I'm talking about even internally, like Cointel Pro, like infiltrating the Black Panthers, right? right? Uh, war, the Operation Warm Wood about psychedelics, right? Like right. we, uh, in the document for the audience, we share actually this great infographic called uh, the conspiracy chart that basically kind of categorizes conspiracy theorists in different, like from true all the way to progressively higher levels of detachment from reality. Right. Uh, it, it, what's interesting about it is that Daniel and I were commenting before the show how uh, you would probably have to update this pyramid fairly frequently because some of these things that like when this was made, uh, turned out to be not necessarily completely detached from reality. I think yeah. the one that stands out to me the most is COVID-19 was made in a lab. Oh, yeah. It went from complete conspiracy theory only held by fringe people into a somewhat mainstream talking point. I mean, now yes. the Biden administration right, is pushing for uh, longer investigations yep. uh, into into the origin of the of the uh, of the of COVID. Like, so um, I think that's the other thing too, right? Again, it's this notion of uh, the conspiracy theorists uh, conspiracy theories are right like a fraction of the time i'm talking about like mm -hmm. less than five percent but when they're right it's massive it's totally like earth shattering yep which is why i think we end up having as a society a very polarized response yep. where we either completely overlook it we stop talking about it like we talked about the masks in the world health organization for example mm -hmm. Like, because obviously, like, if we just, like, internalize that the CDC just unilaterally decided to tell a noble lie about masks, right, it, we would, it would totally impact our conversation about vaccines, for example, right? Sure. Uh, and, uh, but then on the other hand, you know, like, the, 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 the other side of the polarized response is like, oh, because the CDC lied about this, they're lying about everything, right. which is also extreme and, like, not true. And so because we end up being polarized around these true things, um, we, we end up in the worst possible scenario where all sides are, are like on the wrong side of this issue. <laughs> oh, oh, well, it's terrible. Well, because the issue is too, you know, there's that, that work that we'll share with the audience um, where I talk about uh, Schrodinger and these kind of conceivability structures on the idea that a worldview, a religion, a philosophy, a conspiracy, they all have the same structure. They all consist of information, relation between those information, facts, truths, you know, parcel truths, you know, different things like that. And the issue is that you can't tell just by looking at a collection of information if it's a conspiracy, if it's true or false, because it's coherent. Like, that's the issue. Like, in order to tell that a conspiracy is, in fact, a false conspiracy, 
you would have to investigate it. You'd have to go into it and, and figure it out. Um, but then, of course, if you do that, well, then you've entered into um, seeing the wor world in terms of the conspiracy, which then, of course, totally, are going to... It's a red pill moment. Yeah, it's a red pill yeah. moment. And then it feeds itself. And so how do you get out? You know, the other thing I learned about that I didn't know is apparently the Wilson, or, um, President Wilson, during World War I, in order to um, get people to support the war effort, would tell had the had the government tell a bunch of lies about what the German soldiers were doing and made it absolutely horrible, you know, these terrible things the German soldiers, and then the American soldiers come home, and it turned out it wasn't true, and the American people were very upset. Well, guess what? Then World War II happened, and the Germans were doing these horrible things, like rounding right, right. up people, and, people and, 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 and the American right. people wouldn't believe it. It was harder to get the American people well, to believe it. I, I remember, like, because this was the at a convo, maybe with you, about, like, post-World War I, there was the uh, commission investigating the war effort, mm -hmm. headed, headed by Truman. Precisely because one of the major conspiracy, it's, I don't even know if you call it conspiracy because I think everybody agrees that it's kind of true. Like the military industrial complex in America is super powerful. Right. And basically what the Truman Commission was able to figure out is like, yeah, like part of the reason why the United States got into World War I is because weapons manufacturers were yeah. profiting a ton from it, right? Uh, but then if you look at, you know, like I think the New York Times started covering the concentration camps like way earlier before U.S. involvement, talking about like years, right? Uh, but nobody acted upon it. It wasn't like a popular thing precisely because of the kind of skepticism around uh, characterizing any global conflict as something like worth investing in. Right. Because basically, yeah, like the posture was we can't feed into the military industrial complex. So it, again, polarized responses, right? Uh, and, right. Uh, it, it, and again, it goes back to like this, this notion of, I, I think the truth is so deeply uncomfortable to everybody. Uh, the world is very complex. You're likely not to understand all the forces that are shaping your life, but also mo the, what the biggest force shaping our lives is randomness. Well, yeah. And, you know, you were mentioned, about, you know, a few things. First off, um, I wanted to mention, you know, when you're talking about trauma, there's a really, I think the Japanese have a few programs, movies. They, I like um, Cone, Master Cone. He, he does a lot on these problems of conspiracies and thinkers. There's a show he did called Paranoia Agent where first oh, of all, you know, it's an amazing program. And, he, and, you know, he uh, he did Paprika, Perfect Blue, some of these great classic. Yeah, yeah. That's the where I know him from. And, uh, and in Paranoia Agent, you know, there's, there's this idea that there's this guy going around with a golden bat, like attacking people. Um, you know, spoiler alert uh, for anyone who doesn't want to hear this, please turn off. Um, you know, the, 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 the boy with the bat doesn't exist. But there's enough, re but everyone starts claiming that they saw the boy with the bat and that they were hit with the boy in the bat. For some people, it's a way to get out of responsibility. For some people whose father like, um, abused them, it, it becomes a, a way to hope that uh, something's going to get their dad or then they get attacked by the, the golden boy or they imagine that they were hit by the bat and their dad apologizes and never does it again. And so it's like this, it's this collective, um, it's this collective thing that people imagine that functions as a way to escape their trauma, it becomes a way to cover trauma, or it becomes a way to escape responsibility. And the other character in the show is this uh, mascot that everyone loves. And it's interesting because the show's making a parallel basically between these conspiracy theories and giant corporate advertising mascots, both of which give people ways to hide their trauma and to escape responsibility. Um, so it's interesting that it was drawing these parallels between like capitalist advertisement and also the, these, these kind of conspiracies. Well, it, it, but I mean, you know, that's what's happening, I think, right now with QAnon. Uh, yes. You know, like I think there's there are literally businesses, merchandise. The QAnon oh, yes. merchandise is a massive industry now. So I think that um, because corporations are just going to enter and just try to totally hijack any major big trends, even if it yes. emerges from a completely. And so I totally think that, uh, you know, one of the things that, for example, they talk about in the Sunstein paper is just the amount of bestsellers about 9-11 being an inside job Absolutely. coming out, you know. Um, and but, but I think it's interesting to compare like, you know. Like, because it is true that technically, you know, the intelligence agencies uh, knew about uh, Osama bin Laden starting this network and trying to, you know, uh, do a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. It's just that the information didn't get elevated quickly enough to a decision maker to act upon it, which is very right. similar to what happened in Pearl Harbor. But it's the right. kind of thing where, like, you know, obviously you can look at it like, well, that's why we have the NSA. That was one of the major things that, you know, passed after 9-11, right? We started developing a centralized entity for yes. a bunch of... For this kind of national security, 
but at the same time, like I can totally see why a regular person would be like, because they don't understand like how terrible bureaucracies can be. They would think like, there's no way that the United States did not know about this. And so if they knew about this, how, why did they not stop it? It must've served like somebody's interest. And right. then you start with another conspiracy, like, oh, it must've been to get oil in Iraq, right? Uh, as opposed to the much more disturbing truth, which is like, uh, both parties actually thought there were WMDs in Iraq yes. because the media sensationalized a bunch of fringe evidence uh, again, to 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 high to to because they were financially incentivized, right? right. To pr play on people's trauma. Because I think we 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 forget that now. You and I are old enough to kind of remember this, but like some of the debate kids I work with that are Gen Z, like mm. they were born like way past nine eleven, so they don't understand the kind of trauma America experienced, you know, yes. following the event and how like yeah, like uh, it's almost like when you experience that kind of trauma, you know, even a one percent chance risk, you're not willing to take. Right. And that was the whole like position of the Bush administration with Cheney, right? Like oh, yeah. a 1% risk ought to be addressed, even though under traditional circumstances, right? You're not willing to act upon it. You're willing to kind of ignore it because, like, yeah, like the last time you ignored a 1% risk, like a terrorist attack on US soil, yeah. like it just happened, right? So um, I think these things are like, Again, I think I think that's that, that's part of what's what's challenging about the reality is that there are major forces shaping our world. Uh, right. there, there, it's probably these things though are emergent. Rarely are they some sort of like you know intentional plot. But the biggest source of problems overall is randomness, and uh, it, it's just hard to. And I think that's why most people. Uh, you know, fall in one spectrum or the other. Either they think things are random, so you can ignore them, or they think there was like huge intentionality, right? Huge forces that we need to pay attention to. And I think we are all that way, just on different issues. Like on some issues, we may feel like it was determined. In some issues, we might feel like it was random, right? That's right. Um, but, but, but I will say this. I think that in my work with conspiracy theorists, like I've, I've noticed that there's what we would call in medicine comorbidity, Hmm. Uh, which is like when you went, when like one, the condition uh, is very correlated with having another condition, right? For, you know? And um, so, so it's usually there, there's like a constellation of conspiracies that the conspiracy theorist believes. Rarely is the conspiracy theorist just like, cause again, they're chasing that dopamine. Right. Right. Again, right. right? So for example, with a lot of flat earthers, usually the constellation is w the moon landing was faked. And the moon landing was faked because we wanted to defeat the Soviet Union right. uh, and force them into bankruptcy by investing in space technology. Uh, and the, you know, and so if the moon landing was faked, you can't trust NASA. NASA is the, or, or, right, the right. ultimate source of, like you see what I'm saying? It's like yeah, it's so they end up in, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, like I've I've rarely found, even though I'm sure they exist, like incoherent conspiracy theorists. Like it seems yes. like, you know, like the, the, the conspiracy theories that they pick up on are all very related um, to one another. Well, so a few things, you know, the point you get. So first, you know, on the idea of conspiracies being emergent, you know, that's where, again, going to the Japanese, they have that idea in Ghost in the Shell of the standalone complex, which is. This oh, yeah. Kind Let, of, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's such a brilliant com idea, you know, where you have this conspiracy of the laughing man who's coordinating all of these crimes. But actually, all of the individuals doing these crimes are simply inspired by the idea of the laughing man who's not coordinating anything to do their own works that makes it seem like there's this giant coordinated plan when really it's everyone almost just kind of following this center that has nothing in it, thus making the appearance of a center. Um, and and Which, so just to for for the audience, like everybody, I think should look up copycat crimes because yes. this is a real thing. Like shooters do this, uh, both yes. school shooters and just like general shooters. Uh, suicide is a huge thing where it's like there's this contagious effect, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, like it's 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 it's, re it's really strange. Like you know, uh, it, it, it goes back to I guess the mimetic nature of the human mind. Oh yeah, but uh, I think anonymous is like that. Like you know, the hacker group yes. is a little bit like that. Yes. You know, yes, uh, yes. I, I, th I think that um, it has been decentralized, but it feels centralized. And uh, yeah, I mean, like in the, it, it can be totally emergent, but then once there are enough copycats and then people start copycatting the copycats, then you mm -hmm. no longer need an original. No, and, 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 you know, and, let's delve deeper into external complex because I actually think that's the best mental model to understand QAnon. So like, sure. talk about more like in the show. Oh, well, I don't want to, it's such an extraordinary classic, I'll try not to ruin anything, but you know, the image I would say for a standalone complex is imagine that you have this circle, um, and it's all filled in except the very middle, and it's just, that's kind of left open. Um, so in the center of the circle, there's actually an absence of, of marks. 
But you'd almost have to conclude just by how it looked because everything around it is filled in that that center was coordinating. And yet what's strange is the exact opposite. It, it's everything but the center is action, but the center doesn't have action. But the whole reason that the whole circle is filled in around that center is because everyone believes there's something in the center. So nobody goes in the center when really it's just an emptiness that then you end up with the appearance of there being a center. Um, now that was a very strange image I tried to you know depict with words there. Um, but you'd almost have to rationally conclude if you were looking at that, that there was something going on in the center to make something look that perfect. And the idea of the complex is the idea that the complex is able to stand alone without any support. Like the entity is able to stand alone without any, any center. And this makes it very difficult to defeat because usually you can take out an organization by destroying the center, right? But you see, if there is no center, well, then it always can reformulate quite easily because it can never be unveiled to itself that it's false. Like, for example, exactly. you exactly. know, it's, it's not if, falsifiable. It's not because falsifiable. Why Popper was very concerned about conspiracy theorists, right? Because, like, a, you know, he thinks that, like, a, a healthy epistemology is all about accumulating evidence that disconfirms yes. your belief as yes. opposed to what conspiracy theorists do, which is like they only look at evidence that confirms their belief. Well, and the problem is, like, for example, if, um, if you had a, the CEO of a company, and it was unveiled um, that the CEO was monstrous and he was taking advantage of workers in third world countries or something like that. Well, then the whole company could be taken down, right? Because you say the CEO do this and, you know, this, this is kind of the, the heart of the whole organization. So you would have reason to think that the entire company was, was in the wrong because of the CEO. But what if you had a company where you had no leaders, but it was indeed a corrupt company, um, but you didn't have any leaders? How, how would you be able to unveil that the company was wrong? It would be much more difficult. You'd have to go to all of the, the parts of the company and third world nations. You'd have to look in all the computers. It would, it would precisely because the corruption was less centralized that it would be harder to stop. And yet there's this kind of idea that when you get rid of a, cent a center leader, well, that's actually good because it's usually the center le leaders that are bad. But what we're discovering today, it's almost like a trade-off. It's like, you know, maybe it is the case that when you have someone in the center of an organization, precisely because they're so powerful, you know, uh, power corrupts absolutely. So there's this idea you're more likely to get a corrupt person. But you see, it, it's kind of easier to identify the corruption or to identif identify the, the problem because you can just see it in the, the head of the organization. But what we're having now is the formulations of these groups that in not having a center, they're not so easy to, to get rid of. And so they stay alive. Maybe they're, maybe they're in a sense more harmless or at least seem more harmless because they're just diffused onto the internet. But as we saw with what happened at the Capitol, things can eventually yeah. manifest. Exactly. Um, exactly. So we've trade off. It's almost like today we, we talk about decentralization always in a positive way. We talk about it as always being good because it gives power to the people. Well, yeah, we're giving power to the people, not to the expert. We talked earlier about how we require authorities to know anything. Um, we require authorities to, to know that the world is, is round or, to, or that vaccines work or, the, or these different things. So when you take power from authorities and give it to the people, well, then you're also taking away the trust in those authorities that is required for people to know anything. That may make them less susceptible to being taken advantage of by right because it's all about it's about it's all about trust right yes it uh, all comes down to trust even though what's what's funny about this is that uh bitcoin mm. is almost like a i mean i would argue a constructive version of QAnon, where basically yeah. right this anonymous character orchestrated this shared reality game and this is related to an article that we're sharing oh, yeah. Him yeah, about yeah. a game designer analyzing QAnon. Uh, which is fascinating. I highly recommend it. Probably yeah, the amazing. best article I've read on this topic. Yeah. Um, but if you think about Bitcoin, it's like, yeah, okay. So Satoshi Nakamoto, this mysterious person, there may be more than one person, obviously. Um, they, they anonymously published Bitcoin. And by the time the government realizes just how effective it is, you know, uh, it's able to create a trustless infrastructure for a global yeah. financial yeah. network, you know, that uh, nobody can stop. And then Ethereum gets started in response to Bitcoin. So then even if Bitcoin died, you would still have Ethereum. So it's like this whole, like, you know, if, if, you, if you don't stop it quickly enough, if you don't stop the contagion quickly enough, uh, yeah. this decentralized system kind of, it becomes autonomous. And the, in the article, right, the, the game designer basically argues that uh, QAnon is like a version of Dungeons and Dragons where yeah. Q is like the master, right? S setting yeah. up the narrative, right? Um, 
because it's actually, I thought it was interesting, he makes a great point. Like if you look historically what whistleblowers do to expose government conspiracies, whether it's the Pentagon Papers, whether it's the Afghani Papers with Chelsea Manning or uh, the Snowden leaks, you know, about the NSA security, right? They release everything at once, usually right. actually through some sort of mainstream institution. Whereas QAnon like releases things like piecewise. Yep. Because again, it sets up this kind of gamified real alternative reality. Sure. Right. Uh, where everybody kind of become engages in this form of groupthink, right? Because they're enjoying the game and they're just accumulating these random evidence, right, about all these leaders, right? Uh you know, using the same signs and communicating, you know, these signs. But in a way, that's exactly what happened with Bitcoin, except with Bitcoin, again, it's constructive. Uh right. the it meets the reality test, even though money is like some sort of convention. Like it hacks the convention process to create something real. Whereas QAnon, it like sort of failed. I mean, it, we can argue about the extent to which it's still it's it's still succeeding, but it failed because it predicted Trump winning. Right. So it got denied empirically denied by reality. Whereas Bitcoin is not structured by the kind of thing that's empirically denied by reality. Uh, but it becomes real. Like Bitcoin becomes like a real currency. Crypto becomes like a real system uh, precisely yes. because there is no, like you said, there's no point in which like the social convention loop behind this technology ends. Because even well, if one project fails, even if Bitcoin were to fail today, crypto would still exist. Yes. If Bitcoin had failed within its first few years of existence, crypto would not exist. But like now it's past that point. Well, because it's a kind of standalone complex, and that's what ends up happening. Exactly. Exactly. Isn't that crazy? Uh, it's, it's, it's it's the best mental model to understand. Is it's literally yeah, it's it's, it's extraordinarily useful. I mean, the Japanese have been concerned about this for a very long time, and thinking about this, you, you know, a few things. Before, um, one of the things I was going to note, you were talking about capitalism making merchandise for QAnon. Well, there's these capitalist ideas that also feed conspiracies. You know, think for yourself, be your own person. You know, Jefferson, seek the truth, no matter what. It leads you know there's this kind of independence of thought that capitalism promotes in freedom that is good that has some goodness but you know what do these people in these conspiracy think they're you know i'm the lone person seeking the truth i'm the whistleblower no one else you know listens to me well i would say like now like it becomes a problem where it's no longer the lone person i actually think oh well this is what i want to get into yeah 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 yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah 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 that's the problem like now it's um it's it's like now on the group we're like this tribe of people and i wanted to bring up the freud work on the group psychology movie yes. psychology because yes. what ends up happening is it used to be Usually, um, um, it's interesting that conspiracies tended to be like the movie The Game that we have in the notes. You know, it's Michael Douglas. It's like one person is caught up in a conspiracy and nobody believes them. Like classically, rather it be Thomas Pitchin with, uh, with Mass, it's like one person fighting the conspiracy and they're all alone. What's so interesting today is now conspiracies are like groups. And so you can be in a group and it's all thanks to the internet that you can do this, that you can find other special people who, you know, are part of it, whereas before it was kind of unimaginable that m multiple people who assented to the post uh, the post office doing something crazy with trumpets like in the crying of lot 49 would meet one another but now it's very easy to meet one exactly, another exactly because social media makes them uh, yeah so it's almost like super through. bad because then you it, it, in the past it was like one person going on a conspiracy which then the very fact that they were alone might help them not uh, feed it because they would start to step back and go, well, I'm the only guy. If everyone else thinks, well, me, do am I really so sure? But now you can also get groupthink plus conspiracy. Exactly. You can get, you know, you got this unique dynamic now where you can get so social support from the group. And, you know, if that work we did based on Eric Job's great, great class is correct on the idea that in Freud, you know, he talks about the question of his group psychology where people do crazy stuff, you know, where we, you know, all the different psych experiments, the Stanford stuff, et cetera, et cetera, you know, is group psychology unique from individual um, psychology? And what Freud argues is that in a group, individual restrictions on behavior come down. You feel like you can let loose. You can do things that you wouldn't be able to do alone because now you're in a group and the responsibility is di dispersed and so on and so forth. And the argument we try to add to that is um, what's weird is Therefore, in Freud, group what people do in gr groups is very similar to dreams, because in dreams, repressions are down, you can have wish fulfillment, you know, the subconscious mind can come out. So likewise, in a group, the subconscious mind can come out and you can pursue what you it, want. It could be this paranoid associationist network. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's this free floating thing. That's what I'm saying. Like the yeah. conspiracy internet, it's like the yeah like it, it totally feels like a dream right it feels uh, like a dream it, it's digital anonymous right it's group level 
right? And it's and it constantly oscillates in all sorts of directions that are not entirely like sensical. No, and then that gets tied to what you're saying about the video game because dreams are structured like movies. You know, there's a lot of philosophers who talk about that. And, and it's the idea that like a movie, you can jump out of scenes, the camera can switch, you know, you're just suddenly thrown in the, to the middle of action. So there's a structure of movies that's like dreams. So then it all gets linked together. You're in a conspiracy, you're in a group, which has the structure of a dream, which is structured like a movie. So now you're in a movie and it's gamified. So it's exactly. this super powerful um, situation where, which gives you community, which gives you wish fulfillment, which gives you meaning, which put, makes the world coherent, that puts things together. Um, so it, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes very, very, very powerful. And the thing that I think is extremely important to understand that, you, that you've been pointing to is that conspiracies, they're possible because of the randomness of reality. Since you don't have a deterministic universe, it's more random. Therefore, you can have all these different um, internally consistent systems made. But what's happened now is the internet um, has supercharged rationality. Like it's made a giant collective consciousness that when you take a super, like when you take a super genius and, and add it to randomness, then you get, you know, uh, you get Newton making all the alchemy. You get John Nash doing all the, the stuff that he's being pursued by the government. I almost want to say yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, John Nash would talk about his, his uh, neurodivergence with schizophrenia helping him generate his genius. But what's really critical, as it talks about in the, the book on The Beautiful Mind, is that the, the mental, the, the schizophrenia is a result not of a lack of rationality, but an overabundance, too much, too much rationality. Yeah, because you oversubscribe. No, that's totally true. I think and, and, Bobby and, Fischer is another example of a schizophrenic person sure. who was clearly capable. I mean, to this day, you know, he's considered one of the most interesting chess players to have ever lived, mm. right? Because in terms of recorded games, Bobby Fischer saw oh, Fisher, yeah, that nobody else saw, right? Yeah. Uh, which is probably also why... Even though he was half Jewish, he thought there was some sort of Zionist yeah, conspiracy. Oh yeah. Against yeah, yeah, and he died <laughs> like, in Iceland, you know? right? Oh, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So I think I think that the, the uh, this this obsession over, but 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 again, it goes back to like I also want to make this very clear, right? Uh, I think there is a coalition. Like when conspiracies become very big, right? Like the what happened to the Capitol, um, there is a it's a coalition. You have the people whose personality, right, just makes them more paranoid. Oh right? yeah. Um, you have then the people that are in it for the game. It's like yep. a gamified sense of community yes. because they're like, only whatever. Then there are people that are just purely reactionary, right? Uh, and so the thing is, like, they don't even perceive themselves that way. The outside world treats them as all the same. Yep. And so when the outside world reacts, they say like, oh, you must be some sort of paranoid schizophrenic. And the person is like, if that's the best argument you can give me, then I'm probably right. It's like exactly. almost, I think within rationalism, it's called the fallacy fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically rejecting a conclusion just because a bad argument for it exists. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and you see the issue is I kind of want to say that conspiracy is a result of too much rationality in the same way. It's like too much rationality plus randomness. You know, if you've got a collective super consciousness on the internet that encounters randomness, it's going to figure out how to make it look coherent. It's going to figure out how to put it together. Yeah. In the well, same it's overfitting, right? It's yeah, overfitting. it's overfitting. In the same way that Newton is going to figure out how to make his alchemy and his theology and all the different things go together because he's got that super mind. In the same way that Nash is going to figure out how to make his views of all the different things he saw make sense. You see, it's almost like now collectively we have the super intelligence to make these crazy um, internally consistent systems like the great geniuses of history were able to do because we have the internet. So we're now able to do that. So now I don't think it's by chance that the internet is almost splitting between people going down the conspiracy rabbit hole and other people who are using it really, frankly, to become super intelligent. They're using it educationally. Well, I, again, I would submit to everybody that uh, if you take a broad enough view of what, what, what it means to be a conspiracy theorist, uh, we're all super intelligent in some respect and like, you know, conspiracy theorists in other things. The internet, it basically, it basically, I think, makes everybody go through both paths. Sure, but I, but I would say there's a difference between John Nash, who comes up with the Nash equilibrium, and the John Nash who's talking about aliens. Um, you know, they, there's similarly an identical structure. Uh, so in, like a fragmentation of personality. Almost. Yes, that's what I'm getting at, is that the internet has collectively made us kind of like a fragmented personality, like a John Nash. You know, if well, we take... The, the lose in schizophrenic society, right? That's oh, literally yeah. Like the, we're responding to stimuli from the internet that are emergent from the people responding to stimuli. So we all end up like shifting our personalities, uh, you know, continuously. 
Yeah, we're response. all like you're talking about Fisher and Nash. I guess I want to say that like we're all increasingly the collective consciousness that is resulting is one like a Fisher or a Nash. It is split between this um, hyper genius, but then also having to deal with some of the some of the problems of schizophrenia, which of course we don't want to demonize schizophrenia, but as uh, every you have to train it, like we were talking about before. Like now you have to train it, but the problem is. The nature of the conspiracy th theory is to make you think you don't have to train anything. You just have to keep pursuing the conspiracy theory to its logical end. Right, because well, it to goes the back truth. to, it, like, you know, because when I talk to conspiracy theorists, right, I usually ask them, like, two questions. I think that that's like the core of my approach, which is a quick, is for context for the audience. Like, we talked about this in the last episode, but basically one of the takeaways from my research about the cognitive science of conspiracy theorists is that we have to treat them like cult members, Mm. So they were trying to heal because like they are incapable of like getting back in touch with reality on some level because their epistemology is so disrupted by the process uh, because we, because people should not forget just how intense it can be to be in some of these conspiracy places in terms of peer pressure, in terms mm. of brainwashing. It's just like a cult, right? Uh, doesn't mean you can come back from it, but it sure. definitely takes like the, shouting up people doesn't work basically. No. But um, yeah, I usually ask, okay, so what would, convince you to change your mind like this the stereotypical you know Karl popper falsification question like because because that because the thing is i am rarely i mean these days i get better because i just enjoy going on these rabbit holes i re i'm really in a position where i have the factual knowledge to just disprove what people are sure. saying uh and like you describe in your essay about pinch on risk sometimes yeah. if you just like engage too much you just get lost because like you do get to a point where like, well, there's no objective way to prove this wrong necessarily. Like, yes. It just doesn't seem like it's real, you know? Uh, and uh, and then the second question I ask is like, okay, so what are some predictions you'll be able to make about the future that uh, my like everybody else is not able to make? Uh, and that's a more subtle question, right? Because I think that, like I said, um, conspiracy theories can morph into pseudo-religious cults, right? Oh, sure. uh, by getting to a point where they're not falsifiable. And so right. you can, then you can't shut down like the conspiracy theorists that way. But then if you ask them, and I think this was so key, we talked about it in the last interview when I, when I bet against Trump's, um, when I bet uh, against QAnon believers this year, I was actually able to use a prediction market for this, betting that Trump was not going to be president after the election happened. Because the thing is, Q, unlike most people running conspiracy theorists or whatever, made a verifiable prediction. He right. said, Trump is going to be president, he's going to win the election. And then after he lost the election, he said like, oh, it's actually, he's going to be able to be inaugurated president anyway. Right. And when, and, and I really want to point out to people that, uh, I, I think I referenced in the last episode about how, if you look at the millennial cults around the year 2000, that were predicting the apocalypse, where, uh, you know, in the second coming of Jesus around 2000, when it didn't happen, right, uh, then people said like, oh, it's because we we prayed, you know, for right. God not to unleash his vengeance. Uh, and the thing is, like, you want them to put money where their mouth is because loss aversion is the only thing that's more powerful than self-deception mm. in the human mind, right? Mm. Um, and uh, that's why I challenge, like, the conspiracy theories. I'm always like, what's a verifiable prediction that you can make that you would be right about that, like, I would be wrong about because I don't buy into the, I, I don't buy into the theory because most of the time they either shut up because they realize they can't. Or, or they make something and then eventually I force them to put money where their mouth is and then they lose and the conversation radically changes. I right. found that that's the most effective approach, to be honest, by first inviting them to make a list of all the evidence that contradicts their opinion. And then, uh, and then yeah, making a, trying to make verifiable predictions that end up being disproven. Well, I, I think your you know, that that approach that you have for conspiracy theories is extraordinarily important. And I applaud you for it. And I hope you do more of it. Um, because as I think, hopefully the conversation is making clear, and I think all the different works we've posted should should help expand on rationality cannot stop conspiracies, because the structure of conspiracies absorb rationality, and they are arguably a result of too much rationality. Um, also, too, conspiracy is that we were mentioning earlier about how so much of your knowledge is relying on authority. Well, like you said, you get in a conversation with a conspiracy theorist, like you're going to find that you actually have not investigated the stuff yourself 
that they're claiming against. Have you ever been to DC? Have you ever met the president exactly, yourself? Exactly, have, exactly. Do you know for a fact, do you, have you examined what is in the vaccines yourself to know that they don't cause well, X, Y, and, and Z? And, and let's use, an, I think we should also use examples of like things that were, things that have a different character. Like did the CIA sell crack in the 1980s? Sure. Right. right. You see what I'm saying? It's like, because yeah. I think it's easy because, and I think this is what happens. It's like when we talk about conspiracy theories, we tend to reduce it to the ones that like are obvious to more of us that they're wrong. Right. Yeah, you're uh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But like, I, I want to really like point the audience to ask yourself, would you have been one of those people that would have believed that the CIA, you know, sold crack to African-Americans in the eighties, that it was That's behind right. the crack epidemic? Like, uh, would you, would you, how would you have felt about the Tuskegee experiments on syphilis? On African Americans, yes, right? That's exactly How would right. you have felt? You see what I'm saying? Like I or Cointel Pro, geez, like the Martin Luther King's was wiretapped. Yes. Like, like it sounds like like let's say like there's a whole like I'm sure at the time it would have sounded like a conspiracy theory. It would have sounded paranoid, yes. right? Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I really want the audience like to really challenge themselves and ask like you know you are not equipped, like n none of us are equipped yes. most of the time to really filter out. The, the what are actual true conspiracies versus just paranoid association uh and so we're just one conspiracy away right from being yes. captured just as easily you know well it's a huge point because like you're mentioning the tuskegee experiment like the, the problem with the authority circle is you are relying on authorities and you have darn good reason not to trust them i mean we're talking about like relying on you know with a lot of these bio um biotech companies but what about the opioid crisis we know that Absolutely. pharmaceutical companies. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's another great example of like, I'm, yeah. I mean, there's good reason not to trust bar, bio pharmaceutical companies. And yet, if you dare to suggest that the bio pharmaceutical companies are questionable, you're viewed in it as an anti vaxxer instantly now. Totally. I mean, you know, and that's. In and, and on the opposite end, like being a, being radical against GMOs yes. is okay somehow, even yes. though it's yes. just as <laughs> extreme of a response to what is, what is historical happen, which is like, yeah, like some. Companies have lied about fertilizer causing cancer, but that doesn't mean that fertilizer wasn't one of the biggest revolutions in food production. Well, even but, but I think also what we're getting at is, one, what you're getting at is so important that basically none of us have the ability to identify conspiracies well. We think we do, uh, but we can easily get swept into them. I think also we are increasingly facing the, dare I say, the collective trauma of realizing more and more of how vulnerable we are to manipulation as yeah. systems and governments and corporations and all these things become larger and larger and larger. You know, if you come up to me and you say, hey, Daniel, in Lynchburg, there is a, um, you know, there's a hacker group that's trying to break into your computer. Well, I live about eight minutes from Lynchburg. I can get in my car and drive over to the warehouse you pointed out and go look for myself, right? But if you were to tell me, hey, Daniel, the, the CCP, China, is trying to break into your bank account and take your information and is planning to launch a war in America, well, there's no way. How, how am I going to get to China? How am I going to get on a plane? Even if I could, you think I can get into the CCP? You can't do it. And so increasingly, you're being asked to have an opinion about things. Totally. That I, I think globalization and like internet media, right? Like globalization creates all these feedback loops that make the world less predictable. And then the media just puts them up front and center. Like yes. it surfaces them like, you know, precisely to be vulnerable to your cognition, you know? And, uh, you know, because like, I think they've done these studies, right? Where they ask people like, how, how frequent do you think are terrorist attacks uh, relative to uh, plane crashes, yes. relative to kidnappings? And like people get them completely wrong because yeah, the media would make it, would make it seem like, you know, uh, kidnappings are happening all the time. When actually yes. I think the statistics, you know, from the FBI are like the most child kidnappings are from the non-custodial parent. It's rarely actually a child pedophile. Oh, cult, well, you know, kidnapping your child. Well, yeah, and it's like that paper, The Grand Technology, which is a play on the Grand Inquisitor, that makes the point that, you know, if today 0.001% of people on the planet suffered something terrible, like 0000, well, that would be thousands of people. Um, and the media would have thousands of stories and be able to make it look like the world was on fire. Yes, and exactly. we we right. all know that that's a statistical mathematical truth that you, you you can have a very 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 small percentage over large numbers that's going to still give you lots of incidents. But you see, before the media and the internet, we didn't have to see that mathematical truth personalized. We didn't have to see the images of that mathematical truth. We didn't we didn't have to encounter it personalized. We just knew it. And so now, every single day, you know, the day goes by and to point zero 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 one percent of the population something terrible happens but that's tim down the street 
or that's Johnny over there. It's like that's having these things happen to them. And so we feel like we need to do something about it. But then when you're dealing with these giant complicated systems, you change one thing, it can have black swan and unintended consequences. So that's the other variable. We're increasingly feeling the tension of having so much of our lives controlled by and sorted by authorities that we can't check for ourselves, that we have to trust, while simultaneously having personified the inevitable um, the inevitable fact that every day there's going to be some degree of terrible things that happen. So those are being thrown in front of us, all while we're simultaneously given an internet that makes us um, have infinite information at our fingertips that makes us feel like we really can figure everything out and figure out how to make things better. And then we don't have the epistemic tools to necessarily how to use that internet. Um, and then all of that is, is kind of coming together as well with this kind of capitalist impulse to be your own person, to think for yourself. And then here's the other thing. You feel epistemological responsibility. You feel intellectually irresponsible not to look into these, these issues, to not look deeper totally. into QAnon. Because it's, pre it's preying on, yeah, like our, it's preying on our, some of our deepest fears, right? Like we have yes. to have an opinion on this because gosh, like, you know, if, uh, if one child gets kidnapped, you know, yes. from, you know, like, like you have to do it again. Like the, you know, the story I shared last time, actually I wanted to use the today's interview as an, as a, an opportunity to clarify something I said incorrectly last time. So I said, I discussed the story of when I subscribed to r slash conspiracy, the subreddit dedicated to conspiracy theorists mm. and how, um, uh, most of the time I was pretty comfortable just ignoring most of the stuff they were saying. Cause I was like, this is probably dumb. Sure. Uh, it helped me understand though. Cause like something like 40% of the conspiracies discussed on the subreddit uh, were about child pedophile rings of some sort, right. which is why I'm not surprised that QAnon at its core, it's about a child pedophile ring. Right. Uh, cause I, and we discussed how it's probably because for some people, the moral disgust response just biologically is, is disproportionate relative to the average. Uh -huh. uh, and so for them, like, from an expected value calculation, even though the probability is low, because the magnitude is higher for them, uh, it still meets the threshold for action. Right. But I, but it, but the example I gave was at one point there was a, a doctor in New Delhi that was molesting you know, these children, and the government was covering it up, and then it, it, it showed up on the Wall Street Journal like two weeks later. Uh, it turns out, and uh, it's kind of ridiculous why, why I made the mistake, but basically, it's so it's not the Indian Health Service as in India in India. It's the Indian Health Service here in the U.S. Uh -huh. So the Wall Street Journal actually last week published a follow-up uh, where basically the government hired a bunch of consultants to figure out what happened. And it's basically the, the Native American Health Service Bureau. Uh, mm -hmm. And it turns out that systematically all the supervisors failed to stop this massive pedophile from preying on, uh, on young Native American boys. Hmm. And uh, so, so first clarification, it's actually not India in India, it's in the US, sure. because we still have used the name from <laughs> colonial sure, times, sure, I guess. Sure. But um, so, 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 you know, hopefully it's a, the audience cuts me some slack on a fair mistake here. <laughs> but, um, but I thought what was interesting is like, yeah, yeah, like, I think the story still resonates today, because, yeah, I realized like, wow, so 3% of the time, these conspiracies are right. And mm -hmm. they're right big time, like, Oh yeah, my right. God, like, you right. know, the Indian health service was enabling this pedophile to just like, I think if you just look at the numbers of how many boys ended up being molested, it's insane. Like, right. you know, it's totally the kind of thing that we should act upon, right? But the thing is, you would never, like, I could not tell which 3% was right. And That's after it happened one yeah. time, yeah, like I knew it was like, this is going to compromise my brain because now I'm going to take, I'm going to like change my risk assessment that's and i'm gonna right. start thinking that 10 percent, you know just to cover that three percent that's right um that's right then uh it it, 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 it would just permanently compromise my epistemology and i think like the that's what happens with other conspiracy theorists is like the internet enables you to see true conspiracies at a way higher rate than at any point in human history i mean we went from because imagine like the average like 40 year old how many conspiracies they've seen happen like, you know, in plain sight, you right. know, we discussed the mask thing, but like the other one that I asked QAnon people, like, why do you believe this uh, is Epstein. Right. So many of the QAnon people I've talked to when asked them what onboarded you to QAnon is uh, Epstein. And Epstein is like the closest thing to QAnon that has ever happened, right? Like we're talking right. about like a network of wealthy elites engaging in sex trafficking right. all headed by a single guy and you know there was like a massive cover-up and then you know did he really die or was he killed in prison you see what i'm saying it's right. like it's like the thing is like the 
I, I understand why most people just ignore these things, but um, eventually you fall, you, you, you either just like don't care, like you just become a nihilist, right? Uh, and so that's, you, you will never get trapped by a conspiracy or eventually the media will find something oh, to yes. hook you on. But this is the terror because basically, basically the media has corporate interest, money interest, and so does politicians to find some subject that can get people supercharged and feel like they have to go deeper into it and then they're hooked. And exactly. it's, you know, and it's kind of easy. Well, this is the problem. Like if I were to say to you right now, hey, Lorenzo, um, you, you know, uh, your neighbor is part of a pedophile ring. What, do you know that he's not? Or, you, you know, how, how do you know that he, he's not? Well, I know him, I trust him. Well, of course he's been putting on a, you know, he's been putting on a face. You know, by, by being willing to say, hey, Lorenzo, your neighbor is part of a pedophile ring. The, the idea is so horrifying and so terrible that it almost, the, the very fact that I put it has now put the idea in your head. It's kind of like Inception, right? Exactly. Yeah, totally. totally. And now it's there. And all I, I can just step back and, you know, maybe you should just go over there after this talk, Lorenzo, and check just to make sure. And you don't see anything wrong. Well, maybe you should check tomorrow just to be sure, right? You know, I can just come up with it. Now, this example is not, you give, you may give a little bit of plausibility, like with the Epstein case. He just happens to die. You know, he dies. Okay. It, well, that's enough plausibility to then get people really looking to see if there's something going on. And Absolutely. now it goes on forever. Like anyone at any point can put an idea in your head that can lead you down, you know, madness. I mean, the great example, of course, is Shakespeare's Iago in Orthello, right? Yes, yes. You right, know, yeah. once, he, oh. once he says, well, how do you know, uh, you know, Desimonda, you know, how do you know she hasn't been cheating on you? How, how do you know, Orthello? I think it's Desdemona. Desdemona, I never yeah. said correctly. You know, D, <laughs> we'll see Miss D. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Desdemona, you know, how do you know? And he lit, you know, Iago with his words, and he's supposed to represent kind of Satan, um, is able to get... Um, Orthello to throw everything away. What's that? Well, if, don't don't forget. There is also the uh, the scarf. Or like yeah, you find it, and that's an anchor chief or something. Yeah, that's yeah, right. it's, it's like because in the context of all the prior manipulations, that's seeing right. the anchor chief, right? That's, like, that's right. He gets that one line. <laughs> you know, um, he, and Orthello has that extraordinary line where he says something like, um, "Tis better to be much abused than to knowest but a little." Right. It is better to be much abused than to know us but a little. And that's such an extraordinary line because it's this idea that Othello, it, it has double meanings. You know, Shakespeare is always, um, uh, Shakespeare is always doing these double entendres. So one, you have the idea is he's saying it would have been better if um, Miss D would have slept with 100 people and I not know about it than for her to sleep with one person and I know about it. But then the idea of being much abused is the idea of being beaten up and like taken advantage of. But to know us but a little, the single idea uh, that can drive you crazy. Uh, and that's what's happening. Everyone now, it's all, everyone now finds himself in this. The internet makes it very, very easy to encounter Iagos. It makes it very, very easy to find handkerchiefs. And then what do you do? And then what do you do? There's because a very... Because well, also what's interesting is that it's almost evolutionary. Yes. Because uh, we've already seen it with television uh, because, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Because mm -hmm. we've seen it with crime. Uh, I think that's one of the things that people forget about, like mass incarceration, you know, like about the whole narrative that's it's complicated. It's like, yes. because the, Cl the Clinton administration quadrupled the incarceration rate right. relative to Reagan. So if Ronald Reagan is supposed to be the devil, I don't know what the, yeah, <laughs> the right. Clintons are. But the thing is, it was bipartisan because that was also, if you think about the 90s, like it was like the time where television really like achieved its yes. peak. And they were just showing all this urban crime, pretending like, oh my gosh, it's like everywhere. Like, right. you know, we all need to be paranoid and everything. And that's what created the extreme response, right? That's right. And so already we were seeing with television, the proliferation, you know, because again, there's a capitalist interest in hijacking your attention, right? right? So nobody was looking at all the channels that were not covering crime and that's thinking, right. wait, so only one out of these 10 channels just covered this crime, right? right? So maybe I should take it less seriously. It's like, no, no, like eventually with enough people just you know looking at channels randomly they will stumble upon one that will just like completely capture their attention and they will That's be right. th their brain that thinks in normal distribution like height that thinks like everything in life follows the kind of you know everybody's in the middle most people you know very, only right. very few people on the extremes like they don't understand how some things are just like mostly in the extremes right that's right uh, and uh but then i think the internet is the next level uh of television right where oh, it's yes. like oh yeah you, you, you're getting billions of people now and nobody's aware of just how much news they're not reading and how many arguments they're not hearing, right? right. Uh, and the internet is engineered through artificial intelligence to find you something that keeps you on the platform.
and it will eventually like the more time you spend on it, the more it will just radicalize you about different things because that's the fundamental business model of the attention economy. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. That's what makes me optimistic a little bit more than like right. television. Uh, cause I do think actually there's a version of the internet that's just as profitable. That's not as, as dangerous. I think television, unfortunately, is not that way. Right. Because of advertising. Um, but, um, but yeah, like, I mean, the, we're going through an evolutionary process. Like we, as the audience are the natural selection mechanism for, uh, extreme events that become representative, uh, you know, but extreme, extreme anecdotes that misrepresent reality, basically. Oh, oh yeah, because because what if that's representative of something larger? Are you just going to sit there and do nothing? Well, because I mean, most of the time we think that it is because we think, again, it's like, you know, events are distributed like height, right? That's Where right. That's if right. you see something, like, like you don't assume that the first, you know, if you saw like a ton of people being 6'3", you would assume that that's the average, right? right. You wouldn't assume, wait, wait maybe I'm just on an NBA game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> oh, well, that's huge. And you see, the issue is that, I don't, I think it's not by chance, uh, exactly as you mentioned, that the majority of these conspiracies involve pedophilia, because is there anything worse? I mean, murder is bad, but pedophilia, you know, I think we all have a natural impulse where if two grown men shoot each other, we go, well, that's terrible, but pedophilia, I mean, it, it's absolutely unacceptable. So then you're made to feel that if you just sit here and scroll to the next page and say, well, that's just a lie, that's not true, then you're risking, you are sitting there and risking some child being molested. Exactly. And it goes back to the expected value calculation. If it's supposed to be, you know, payoff times probability, right. if the payoff is really high, yes. right? Because in this case, your response is like higher than normal, you will accept a lower probability, yes. right? Before you can act upon it. Like if usually, you know, the multiplied, you know, value times probability needs to be a certain level, right? You can achieve that level sooner, right? If you're, uh, uh, if the value it all of a sudden increases, because again, you have this like kind of moral response, right? Uh, that's exaggerated. You know, well, but... and, and, and the key is like in the book, The Conflict of Mind, one of the key ideas of The Conflict of Mind is to show that there are situations where epistemic responsibility comes in conflict with epistemic possibility, where it is literally not, even if you do have some sort of intellectual responsibility to learn for yourself if um, the, the vaccines work or not, to, to, to research it, to go into the lab, it is literally not possible for you to do that because you don't have the background. <laughs> or if it's epistemically responsible for you to read about QAnon before you decide that it's wrong, um, well, you, you, it may not be possible for you to get all the documents or to interview all these different people. Uh, and yet you, it kind of feels almost epistemically irresponsible to just say out of the blue that QAnon is wrong without actually doing any work. And yet if you do the work of investigating QAnon, it could easily be a pitch and risk, which is something that as you investigate, you get pulled in with no guarantee of ever reaching a point where you'll be able to say for sure that it is false or true. Now, I agree with you, QAnon's a little different because they actually made a false, you know, they made a claim that could be verified. But generally, a pitch and risk is something that when you get pulled in, there's no guarantee you'll ever be able to, to know when you should stop going in deeper. And as you go in deeper, it can be harder to leave. Precisely because well, it starts again, filtering again, the, your experience. I think the CIA being behind a crack epidemic. Yeah, is an right. example of like, I mean, I I personally don't even treat people who believe that as like nearly as crazy as every other conspiracy theorist because sure. I understand that like if you come from a, just a certain background and sure. uh, you may just have like a different prior than like I do. Like my prior may be right, I don't prior. think the government is like effective at keeping these things under wraps right. right but then like somebody else's prior may be like well they pull you know look at tuskegee look at cointel yeah. pro this <laughs> wouldn't be the craziest thing after you consider those things right and that's uh, right i i think that's the and i think that's the issue and, and again the we, we discussed how QAnon specifically has gamified this process yes uh, so it, which is again bitcoin did something very similar so i think like we're seeing the next frontier of uh of of, consp of conspiracy of, of conspiracies basically because well I, and, I, like and I, historically right we did not have that dimension like it wasn't a shared multi-reality game no well. and, and i'm glad you brought it so i wanted to bring together here um one so first i wanted to say that we have kind of assumed that rationality if done well will not ever run into any insurmountable problems 
Um, we've kind of believed as the book talks about that there's no essential limitations to rationality, but I think what we're finding is out is that there are, that the problem of conspiracies, the solution to it may not be found in rationality itself. It may be found in just ignoring it or looking the other way. But in order to do that, you must risk that 3% of the time where it's true, and thus you must risk per possibly contributing to something horrible, which is a very existentially difficult reality to handle. And you have to knowingly make yourself vulnerable to authorities, uh, all of which is very, very difficult. Uh, but if there is indeed no solution to these problems, we almost want to believe we can have our cake and eat it too, that there's some way that if we just learn the right rational tools, the right mental models, so on and so forth, that we can overcome this problem. Now, I do really like what you're doing about getting people with conspiracies to put skin in the game, because I do think that that's a really good angle. And if you see all the QAnon people putting, you know, not willing to put skin in the game, that could help you yourself not feel a moral responsibility to go into that pitch and I risk. know, I know. And that's why I think it's so key. I think, yes. I think that's why it's so key. It's the only way out of it because then- I agree. Because the default assumption, because we do this in the criminal justice system, we, the default assumption needs to be innocence, yes. right? Like, because there's no neutral position, right? It's a, it's a binary state of like true false, you know, right. in, in, that, in that context, right? Like, and uh, you always want to, don't make it too hard for the government to prosecute criminals, right. right? You should be comfortable like having criminals like go on free as opposed to overreacting, right? Um, and uh, I think I think that's the only way to shift because in the internet where it creates an abundance, right, of uh, psychologically hooking conspiracies, right. uh, we need to recover some sort of rational ground to say, well, by default, I would just be skeptical, you know? And uh, the, because the traditional scientific paradigm doesn't work anymore because right. the internet enables conspiracy theorists to find, and we share some of the pictures in the document, right? Uh, it just constellations of pictures of world leaders engaging in a particular sign yes. that enables QAnon people to believe that they're communicating through secret symbolism, right? And the thing is, the traditional scientific method, you know, like you're supposed to de develop a position of skepticism if you don't see evidence, right? But that's the problem now is like, right. you know, especially with conspiracy theories, like there is evidence that is easily misinterpreted. Right. So you need something stronger. And again, I think like the put your money where your mouth is heuristic uh, is, is like super key here because I think even asking conspiracy theorists, like, what do you think is that the actual probability here? Yes. Because um, in the video that we share in the document of the Q conference, I highly recommend mm -hmm. that for the audience. We, yeah. we shared this video of... Uh, the no gas, no brakes guy going to this QAnon conference and asking people. And basically everybody says that they don't agree with everything QAnon is saying, right. but they think he's right about some important things. And it, what's interesting is that they all disagree on which are the important things yeah. that QAnon is right about, right? That's right. Uh, they're probably not even aware that they're not actually agreeing on everything, which is funny to me. Uh, but we talked about it last time. It's, it's kind of like political parties. I think uh, people don't understand, like most people in a political party don't agree with the entire platform. Uh, you know, nobody agrees actually with the entire platform most of the time, uh, well, but nobody's but, aware of like what they don't agree with. Right, and that has, but that has a key function of ideological preservation, because if you say that, then if parts of Q are disproven or parts of Democrats are, are disproven, Republicans or so on, you could just shift the variables around to maintain your commitment. Uh, and, and also it makes you sound like a free thinker. So if you said, yes, I believe everything that Q thinks, well, then you can't even tell yourself that you're not a free thinker by just kind of uttering lines where you say, well, I don't believe everything Q says, then that to yourself is evidence that you are a free thinker, that you're a disciplined faker, thinker, and that therefore there's reason to think that your belief that there's something to QAnon is therefore justified because look, you're, you think for yourself. So it kind of has this function of giving you confidence in yourself. I, I think I wanted to add to, to kind of, before we, we close, and I, I would love, I think the work that you were doing on getting the conspiracy, people who believe in conspiracies to put skin in the game is absolutely critical. And I don't see any other answer, frankly, because I don't see an answer in rationality. I mean, the other side of all of this is I do think what um, Zach Stein is talking about that conspiracies and propaganda go together. And yeah. we exist in an age of massive information warfare. Um, and, and, it's, and it's very difficult to prevail over. And it, it gets into where you need certain training and mental models and thinking. But even if you have all of that, you can still easily 
fall into a conspiracy. And some conspiracies can turn out to be true, just like you're saying. So maybe it's not bad if you fall into a conspiracy. And then, of course, that's where the existential or, anxiety. And, and you may learn things that are true, like yes. you know, the mob was really involved in the unions, right? Because that's part yep. of what you would discover with the JFK conspiracy. Even yes. though, like, like, even though JFK may not have been killed, right, by the CIA or something, like, yes. uh, it is true that the mob has really close ties with the unions, the Teamsters Union, you know, oh. the Jimmy Hoffa stuff, right? You know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, a lot of times the conspiracies that are problematic entail on lower levels almost previous conspiracies that turned out to be true to give evidence of a bigger something going on. They kind of absorb it to, to, to give them pl plausibility. Um, and that's part of the problem is you have to go deeper and deeper to figure out uh, what parts are true and what pop parts are extrapolations that don't add up. But once you go in, it starts the conspiracy itself filters your experience in such a manner that you can't that, tell that's true why or false. I, I think, you know, like I think the mental model that like I have in my mind is like, I think if you if, if you take a like a really strong conspiracy theory, I'm not talking about like ones that like don't capture a lot of people. I'm talking about like things like QAnon, for example, sure. that capture a lot of people, right? Uh, or, or like the moon landing being faked. I think of it as uh, you know like probably a third of it is is like true, like all right. things that we tend to ignore and tend to be understated. Uh, I think 60% of it is not true, but then from the perspective of the conspiracy theorists, like there's another 30% that they believe that is true that most people disagree with them on. And there is another third where they don't believe it's true and other people think that it's true, right? Yeah. So it's actually like, and I think that's what ends up making people stuck. And that's why they default to this mode of, I don't agree with everything that QAnon says. I just think he makes good points, right? Because right. they think, well, I do agree that the Epstein, I do, I do, I do agree that Epstein didn't kill himself, right? Uh, and I also think that the deep state is real. I just don't think like, you know, Hollywood elites are drinking children's right. blood. You right. see what I'm saying? It's like yeah. all of a sudden, like <laughs> you think yourself as the reasonable person and anybody yeah. else who is not, is actually not open-minded enough that instead wants to just algorithmically exclude you right from the internet, right? Um, you, your self-defense response comes from, but Epstein was real. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And and so then you get the standalone complex. Everyone has various ways that make them unique and the, the the person who's thinking for themselves that makes them nevertheless participate in the larger movement that uh, makes it seem like they don't think for themselves because they're part of the QAnon. So you have these complicated mental activities that are going on that are very often not appreciated in the discussion about consider um, conspiracies in the same way that often when we're talking about neurodivergence, uh, it's not appreciated that often ra the problem can be ultra rationality, not a, an absence of rationality. And so it goes with conspira conspiracies. It becomes a, it requires a very smart person to make a coherent model, to make a internally consistent system that has no essential contradictions. It is, it is, it takes a lot of intelligence to do that. Unfortunately, the presence of great intelligence does not necessitate the presence of great truth. Uh, it takes a lot of genius to write a great fiction book, um, such as the game of, such as uh, Tolstoy, such as War and Peace, Anna Karenina, and yet these are fiction. But but there's still great genius behind it. So that's that's the problem. If we assume that there's no genius involved in the function of conspiracy, then we're just going to call them stupid. And that's not going to work because that will just be evidence that we're part of the problem, that we're not, we don't understand well, how deeply it, they thought about it. And then they just know, brush this, us off. This reminds me like in the QAnon conference video, right? Uh, right. The guy interviews uh, this YouTuber, right? Who said that uh, within 48 hours of him posting about the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, right. uh, his YouTube channel got deleted. And it's interesting to me that like, I, I swear, like this this algorithmic strategy of like down ranking and just like you know shutting like accounts down or whatever, right. uh, it creates like a uh, like a you know whack a mole hydra effect yes. type of situation, you know, where as opposed to again, part of the thing what has made my approach different, you know, and, and I I would argue very successful, you know, yes. in, the, in the context of that is is because like I go in referencing things like Quintel Pro. Right, referencing right. things like the Tuskegee experiments, like so that the person knows, like I am open minded that this shit can yes. happen sometimes, yes. right? Um, I just fundamentally don't think you know 
uh, the deep state is run by uh, some, yeah. a child yeah. pedophile, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know? the key that you're doing, Lorenzo, is where YouTube is shutting people down, which then makes them be martyrs, which then makes them think, have more reason to think that they're right, frankly. You shut me down. Well, I must be speaking the truth. Why would you shut me down if I was speaking falsities? Um, so you get a martyr complex. What you're doing is basically saying, oh, you, you think this is true? Well, then put money on it. Exactly. So you're not shutting them down. You're just simply making them put skin in the game. And I see no other way to, to fix this problem. And I mean, I also just want to know, you know, I was thinking about that. You, you were mentioning how we're all absolutely, all of us can be falling into conspiracies or all just one day away from being in a conspiracy. I find it really interesting today that the most popular shows are all like game. And what I mean, like Squid Game, Game yeah, of yeah. Thrones. Hunger Games, these virtual reality games, the video game, like games. There's this sense now where I guess the majority of people resonate with something that makes life just seem like a game where everything feels gamified or arbitrary. I was thinking about also too, where after God, you know, Nietzsche said God is dead. You know, if you believe in God, then you believe that there's this uh, being that's in control that has everything, you know, under, under control and providence and so on and so forth. Well, if God doesn't exist, well, then nothing's under, you know, there, there, you can't, um, you can't assume that God's going to take care of the government. You can't assume that God's got the corporations under control or something. So right, then there right. could be There's a no, giant conspiracy. The, right, right. Totally. So, totally. so it's almost like with the death of God, you know, Charles Taylor talks about the Nova effect, where actually the secular age showed that there was a multiplication of religious beliefs. And he tries to argue that secularism wasn't the death of religion, but now there's actually been an explosion of religion. And he wrote this book in 2008. Um, and belonging again, I, the point, I, I think what un, was unleashed by secularism was the multiplication of internally consistent systems. And that, that includes religion, but that also includes conspiracies. That includes any worldview that is coherent. And what ended up happening is when we reached kind of the pinnacle where rationality was supposed to save us all, we found out that actually rationality was only in the business of coherence and it couldn't guarantee us correspondence. All rationality could do is hunt down contradictions in a worldview, but it couldn't necessarily take the, the leap of faith <laughs> to prove yeah. that um, that the worldview was true. Well, then it, well, that was, that's when suddenly there's this massive multiplication. And so now everything feels arbitrary. Now everything just feels like all of these different systems. So it's interesting to me that everyone kind of connects with these shows that are that are about games, where like it's all about a game. It's about getting the well, throne. I, I, I think part of it, you know, is that social media has created a whole new level of surveillance, but mm. it's like self-surveillance, you know, kind of Foucault yes. would talk about like you know, the panopticon, right? So because because if you think of Squid Game and like this kind of mindset, right? It's like I think it's a, a component of it is like we are the most hyper surveilled society in, in existence, whether you're in China and it's top down or whether it's in the rest of the world and it's like decentralized, but you're still surveilled, right? Uh, through social media. And social media not only makes, creates hyper surveillance, it also create, makes us hyper aware of our uh, status hierarchies and yeah. inequality, yeah. right? So I think that's why it feels because it's not just quite we all feel trapped in this bad game right uh it's that we are losing this game <laughs> yes oh absolutely and i'm glad you brought up status because a conspiracy gives you status like you're one of the few people who know the truth you now yeah. have you can now get status i mean you a lot of people who fall into these different things have lost their jobs or they've been laid off and and so there's a looking for explanation so you get status you get explanation and like you say it feels like you're losing the game uh, you feel like that you're falling behind. So there's this general feeling of arbitrariness, which strangely, that feeling of arbitrariness becomes the ground for the unleashing of conspiracy, but also conspiracy can fight the feeling that it's arbitrary because now you're part of an effort to stop the pedophile ring. Well, because, right, because it's, it's almost like the loss of agency implied in a big data world, right? Mm. Where like a corporation and artificial intelligence knows more about you than you know about yourself, right? right. And where like a globalized economy you know, create, can change your for family fortune, you know, in a day, right? right. Uh, the, yeah, like the conspiracy is the one thing where you feel like, cause it's also because it's adversarial, right? It's really yes. like, because here's the thing, I would compare it to uh, 
you know, like they could, a conspiracy to come, you know, to bring about positive change, you know, can be defined as a startup, you know, zero to right. one and Peter Thiel famously talks about is like uh, uh, a startup is a, uh, is an act of conspiracy that works. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but um, I also think like positive religious movements, right. Like nonviolent revolution. It's also a conspiracy for change. Right. Like sure. knowing that like, even though we're a small minority, we're going to win in the end, but like modern conspiracy theories are entirely adversarial. It's not about like, um, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's not, like it, it I want to use these two contrasting examples. It's not about uh, universal childcare. It's about stop the child pedophiles. Yeah, you know, right. so it's not yeah. about like making the yeah, kids yeah, better. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, in the same thing, like you know, uh, AOC's dress at the Met Gala. It's not help poor people. It's tax the rich. Yeah, right, right. But you right. see, like I feel, I feel like the resurgence of socialism, right, in this new form, like right. you know, neo socialism, is like it, it's. It's very similar in that respect. It's like sure. the, it's it's a uh, gamifying, you know, a uh, like a pursuit right against the alleged culprit for the economic malaise. Oh yeah, it, well, and stop the fascist or Trump. Stop the liberals. Stop the Chinese. You know, there's this kind of exactly there's this kind of game that's adversarial, um, and you you've got to win, and because you feel like your your life is in a game, and you you want to finally turn it around and put someone else in the game. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. you want to you want to get that. If, if you're losing, might as well burn it all. Right? Yeah. Well, that's that's the well, that's the you know. There's always that fourth brother in the brothers Karmosov that we that's never mentioned. You know, Smir Smirnov, whose name I can't pronounce, and he's basically the brother who's a result of the process. You know, he's not basically he's forced to serve the the Karamosov family um and he's not even really acknowledged as one of the brothers and he's the one who commits the murder and basically tortures cats and just wants to burn it all down he's basically the joker from from batman and that's that's what ends up happening you know that was the fourth that dostoyevsky the all the brothers and I, I love how tactful you were in not spoiling the standalone complex <laughs> just the screen, you, just the plot. you know we, we try you know what's we funny try. nobody's gonna read the brothers karamosov <laughs> no, okay maybe not <laughs> <laughs> I'm halfway through, but like, uh, I think most of the audience that's more challenging than watching the anime. So, I guess you know, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. So, you know, I tell you, and we try, we try. But so basically, don't ask it with these four brothers. It's like, we're either going to, you know, the world in the 20th century, and now we're in the 21st, they're either going to return to religion, Alyosha. They're going to be hyper intellectuals, um, Ivan, or they're going to turn to pleasure seeking with Dimitri. But what's forgot is there's this fourth option, which is, or they're just going to say burn it all down uh, because they're going to feel their arbitrary and forces they can't control um, to, to, has taken them over and they've been dealt, dealt a bad hand. And I'm afraid we have a lot of that fourth brother that's lurking in our spirits today. And to close, I, I do want to know, you know, I've mentioned conspiracies today, but to I think the key is to realize that every single one of us is in an internally consistent system, is what I call it, or a system that we believe is internally consistent, meaning we ascribe to capitalism because there's no internal contradiction in it that would prove it wrong. Likewise, liberalism, Christianity, Islam, so on and so forth. The, the, conspira the person who's in a, in a conspiracy that you think is crazy, well, they're also in an internally consistent system, just like you. And you just as e all of us could just as easily turn around and tomorrow fall in another internally consistent system. And I think that's really important to note as you've been this entire time trying to emphasize, Lorenzo, which I appreciate, because if we continue to other the conspiracist, if we continue to make them out there and someone we'd never be and we'd recognize if we became, well, that's just going to greatly add to our trouble. And we're probably going to become part of the problem as opposed to the solution, which again, to close, I just want to um, stress that I do think the work you're doing is the solution with the skin in the game. I think that is a extraordinary um, effort and I applaud you for it. And I, I appreciate, Thank and you. I appreciate all you're doing to make that happen. Great. Yeah. Uh, this was a great conversation. It's always, a, always a delight, Loren. Thank you for your time.